This morning, both Bernard and I are going to share with you, and we have a few slides to share too. By the time of Martin Luther, the Bible was a rare book. The only Bible available was the corrupt Latin Vulgate version. By the time of the Reformation, true Christianity was almost extinct after the long, dark night of the Dark Ages. The congregations that had been formed by St. Patrick and Columba were virtually non-existent, as were the Waldensians, the Albigensians, the Wycliffs, the Hussites, and the Nestorians. Age-long inquisitions had virtually destroyed the temple of God, and the papacy had her foot firmly planted in the old world and was about to corrupt the entire new world when the Son of God rescued his congregation by raising up a humble minor son to rebuild the ruined edifice and bring down the man of sin. Protestant Reformation began October 31, 1517, when Martin Luther's 95 Theses were nailed to the Wittenberg Church door. That was almost 501 years ago. Two interesting points. Martin Luther's was not his real name. It was Martin Luther. And the university students at that time enjoyed taking their names and changing them into a Greek or Latin form so that it might mean something special. Martin took the Greek word, eleutheros, which meant free one, and using those letters, which sound like Luther, <laughs> came up with Luther, and it stuck. It was a pun on his theology beliefs and his last name, but it was perfect. And the word Protestant did not come from Luther, but rather from some German princes meeting in the town of Spire, April 19, 1529, who were protesting the Catholic Church and how they had treated Martin Luther. Luther was born, actually, in November 10, 8, uh, 1483, in the little town of Eiselben, Germany. His parents, Hans and Margareta, um, had Martin baptized as a little baby very shortly afterwards for two reasons. They were baptized as soon as possible after birth because so many children died shortly after birth or in infancy. And they wanted their babies to go to heaven because they had been told that if the babies weren't baptized, the babies would go to hell. Katerina von Bora, known to her friends as Kata, would one day have a profound effect on Martin Luther and the Reformation. The history of her birth is not certain, but thought to be January 29, 1499, which is about 15 to 16 years after Martin's. What's certain is that her mother died when she was only five, and her father sent her to a Benedictine cloister for education. Her father's new wife did not want a ready-made daughter to take care of. At the age of nine, she was moved to this Cistercian monastery of Marienthrone, which means Mary's throne, in Nimschen, Germany, where two of her aunts were already nuns. When she was 16, she took vows as a nun. Words that she used later to describe all her time there were lonely and austere. All she said she ever wanted as a child was to be loved by her mother and father, to be lovingly tucked into bed at night, to be hugged and her fears smoothed, and to have enough to eat. But none of that ever happened. The older nuns had too many little girls that needed their attention. By being at the convent, though, she was given the opportunity to learn and to receive an education. She wanted to be a nurse and to help others. Martin grew up in a poor mining family. In 1501, he was caught in a thunderstorm, and the lightning struck very close to him. He was so scared that he vowed to his patron, Saint Anna, that if he lived, he would become a monk, even though he had been destined to become a lawyer. His father, Hans Luther, was furious. Why throw away a brilliant mind and a lucrative career to become a monk? He asked Martin, you claim to have heard the voice of the Lord in that thunderstorm? Are you sure it wasn't the voice of the devil? The scripture says, honor your father and your mother. But 
Martin's decision had been made. Martin threw a goodbye party for his friends, and the next morning he joined the Augustinian monastery in Erfurt, Germany. Life was hard. He often got up at 1 a.m. in the morning to pray, slept on an iron mattress, walked in the snow, and basically tried to appease the wrath of an angry God. He once said, if there was a monk who would make it to heaven on his monkery, I was that monk. Then came his famous but disappointing pilgrimage to Rome in 1510 to 1511. For a faithful Catholic, this was a trip of a lifetime. But what Martin saw in that city was a city filled with idols, corruption, and monks and priests not living according to the Bible. He went to the famous St. Helen's staircase where Jesus supposedly had walked on the way to Pilate's house prior to the crucifixion. And as he was climbing up on his knees, he suddenly heard a voice like thunder. The just shall live by faith. He sprang to his feet and hastened from that place in shame and horror. But the text never lost its power upon his soul. He also tried confession. Once for six hours, went home and realized he'd forgotten to confess one sin. So he felt the whole six hours was wasted. Still did not feel forgiven. But thankfully, Martin had a good mentor at the monastery, Dr. Johann Staupitz, an older monk who encouraged him to look away from himself and look to Jesus. What changed his life was scripture. He discovered the Bible. <clears throat> And in fact, apparently, some day it was in a university library, probably it was a monastery library. And um, as he looked at this Bible for the first time in his life, he said, oh, that God would give me such a book as this for myself. He had heard portions of the Psalms read. He had heard portions of the Gospels and assumed that that's all there was to the Bible. Didn't know there was a, a whole book, complete a word of God, and he was absolutely in awe. Of course, it was in Latin, but he was extremely well-versed in Latin, so it was no problem for him. Romans 1.17, the just shall live by faith, not by sleeping on iron mattresses or a trip to Rome, but it's rather a gift from God. It was a quote from Habakkuk 2.4 uh, that was quoted in Romans chapter 1, verse 17. The righteous by his faith shall live. The word of God by which Luther tested every doctrine and every claim was like a two-edged sword that cut its way to the hearts of the people. This discovery of the word of God in my life is what changed me, he said. He also stated that he says, I'm much afraid that the great universities will prove to be the very gates of hell unless they diligently labor in explaining the scriptures to the youth and engraving them upon their hearts. I advise no one to place his child where the scriptures do not reign paramount. Every institution where they are not unceasingly occupied with the word of God must become corrupt. And that has been fulfilled again today with the many of the popular universities who are totally agnostic and atheistic. October 31, 1517 was the defining day of his life. Um, it is believed that Martin didn't actually nail the 95 Thesis personally, probably one of his students. Anyone, of course, he wrote them. In university settings, professors would write out their thoughts and ideas, a thesis. And Luther had brought a student working with him to post them somewhere at the university, and it got posted at the church door, which was not uncommon. At that point, it was not intended to start a reformation or split the church. They were simply study materials for learned theological discussion. However, someone copied them down, translated them into German, and within a few days, uh, through the help of some very industrious printers, these little pamphlets spread all over Germany and within a few weeks all over of Europe. Of course, in the thesis, he uh, particularly attacked the uh, practice of the indulgences and um, said some other pretty strong things as well. 
One of the challenges, which are particularly upsetting, was that uh, uh, with the sale of the indulgences, people believed that they could actually buy salvation. They could be forgiven for money. And in fact, at one point, uh, the people were offered a very special indulgence. If you paid enough, you could pay for past sins, current sins, and future sins. Now, what could be better than that? Except, of course, it wasn't true. And uh, that particularly <laughs> raised uh, Martin Luther's ire. In fact, a couple of the other things he said in this thesis, which was really supposed to have been a theological discussion, but woke up, uh, woke up an entire continent. Um, he said only God can give salvation. Oof, that was radical back then. Another one he said, only God can forgive. And uh, another one that he stated in this list was the priest must not threaten the dying with the thought of purgatory. And he also said the church through church penalties, in other words, the fear that they were imposing if people didn't pay up, would produce a human crop of weeds. And then he really got into trouble by stating that a dead soul cannot be saved by indulgence because they were also teaching that if you're willing to pay enough money, well, you could get your dead relatives out of purgatory, you know, say 25 or 30,000 years earlier. What a marvelous thought except it was diabolical. The following April, Martin defended his views on the Heidelberg Dissertation. Nobody thought about it. He thought it would stop there, but that's when it started. He debated a certain well-known Dr. Eck uh, in Leipzig, Germany in 1519, and that's when things really got hot. He kept on publishing, teaching, preaching, and the wrong people got a hold of the materials. June 1520, the Pope Leo X said there is a wild boar, of course referring to Luther, in the forest seeking to destroy the church. He issued a bull, which is simply a, a document of excommunication. Today, people don't think too much about excommunication in many parts of the world, but back then it seemed to be quite serious. Um, today, people can leave a church or go to another church or not go to church at all. But back then, if you were excommunicated, you were condemned to hell and would never get to heaven. You couldn't go to another church since it, there was only one official church. You couldn't get buried because there was only one cemetery. And you couldn't even get married or have your kids baptized. So it seemed terribly frightening and terribly serious. In the midst of all this, even though Katerina and the nuns were cloistered away from society, the wind of the growing reform movement begun by Dr. Martinus Luther blew their way. They whispered his name almost reverently. What a wonderful man he must be, the young professor that thundered from the pulpit and the lecture hall against the evils of the church. That thunder even reached their ears. It was said that he knew how to keep the hell-bound spellbound. His quill had written words that shook even the throne of Pope Leo in Rome. The doctor had been excommunicated, branded as a heretic, and a price was put on his head. But he continued to speak out for what he believed to be right. What courage! Katerina and a few of the other young nuns seeking light and peace longed to read his words. A few of the pamphlets eventually reached their hands. They had to be very secretive and keep them and be quite careful not to be caught. They learned that confession should be to God alone as only he can forgive sins, and they certainly were not required by God to kiss relics, and Luther said it was a sin to live in a cloister. As you can imagine, they grew quite dissatisfied with their life at the convent, and they wanted to leave. But that caused a problem, because back then, it was against the law to leave a religious life or to aid anyone who wanted to do so. It was an offense punishable by death. But several of them wrote their relatives anyway, and Katerina wrote her brother Hans, seeking help to leave. But all of them got similar replies. 
Something like, we're sorry to hear that you're not happy at the convent. We wish you could help you, but you must realize that you've lived such a sheltered life that you would not be able to face the wickedness in the world. You have no way of making a living. So we feel it's much better for you to just stay right where you are. Be content. Count your beads. Say your Ave Marias. Pray for the souls of your family. You'll be happier doing that than trying to live out in this cruel world. They were all severely disappointed, but they didn't tell anyone. However, the mother superior soon found out. She had only recently boasted to the bishop that her convent was completely safe from heresy. Now this situation demanded attention. They were lectured on the wickedness of their deeds and penance was meted out before they could be absolved from their sin. They had to crawl on their knees across the cold, hard stone floor to the uncomfortable backless benches and sit humiliated with downcast eyes during the service that followed. They had only thin gruel to eat, and she was always hungry. All of them were. But Katerina was not contrite. She was not sorry she wrote that letter. She had learned that the church had no power over a person's soul. She longed more earnestly than ever to be free. Luther was a bit hot-headed, and so he got together some of his friends, and he burned the Pope's um, excommunication letter, which, of course, was kind of like taking your life in your hands. He then wrote a pamphlet on the Babylonian captivity of the church in 1520. He then touched a sacred cow and writing about what was really a sacrament, an action by a priest for a fellow human being in which God's grace could get transferred to that person. The church said there were seven sacraments. Martin Luther suggested there was only three. It was felt by the church that he deprived the people of God's grace, of God's grace, and so he was really in trouble at that point. He was ordered by the Pope to come to Rome, but as a German citizen, he had the right to appeal to the state. But Charles V banned Martin... And in the end, it was apparently in sight. He was under an edict. Anyone was free to to kill him. Luther told Charles that if he fought against God's Reformation, he would lose everything. And later, Charles did um, lose everything and died a bitter and defeated man. As we said earlier, indulgences really bothered Luther. They're still being used today. It's simply fundraisers with a license to sin. Back then, the money was used to build St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. Martin wrote, in his thesis actually, that since the Pope was so rich, he should build a cathedral himself. And he also wrote in his thesis that he ought to refund everybody's money that had been paid in, personally. Tetzel had been preaching that as soon as as the coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. And Martin then wrote a paper entitled, The Pope is the Real Antichrist. That didn't do anything to win friends and influence people in the Catholic Church. He defended his views at the Diet of Worms. Of course, that was a, just a great convocation, had nothing to do with food. Um, it was a trap, and all of his writings were brought in, and he was told to recant. Um, but as it was said here, he said, unless I'm convinced by the testimony of Holy Scripture or by evident rational grounds, where I do not trust the Pope or the councils, since it is well known that they have erred and contradicted themselves, I will be bound by the Scripture passages I have quoted. My conscience is captive to the Word of God. I cannot and do not want to recant anything because it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. May God help me. Amen. Luther's life was in danger. He knew that he was at risk, but he wanted to preach to the end. In May of 1541, Frederick of Saxony had Luther kidnapped by his friends so that his enemies would not find him. He was put on horseback and after an all-night ride was taken to Wartbard, Wartburg Castle. Martin, who felt that it was a sin to be indolent, chastised himself for not being able to accomplish very much. 
But in spite of his thought process, he decided to translate the New Testament into German, and which he did in 11 weeks. Of course, that was totally by hand. <clears throat> the printing press had been invented uh, by Gutenberg not long before, so that the movable type letters on a square could ink, uh, with ink could copy pages of the Bible um, by the thousands instead of writing each one by hand. So his New Testament was widely distributed. That gentleman he just told you about, Frederick the Wise, we found something this week that I just really fascinated me about him. He had a dream. I'd never heard this before. He had a famous dream the night before Martin Luther's theses were nailed on the door. We step back a moment out of the domain of history to narrate a dream which the Elector Frederick of Saxony had on the night preceding the memorial memorable day on which Luther affixed his theses to the door of the castle church. The elector told it the next morning, October 31, to his brother, Duke John. The dream is recorded by all the chroniclers of the time. Of its truth, there is no doubt, however you choose to interpret it. Here it is. Brother, I must tell you a dream which I had last night, and the meaning of which I should like much to know. It so deeply impressed my mind that I will never forget it, were I to live a thousand years. For I dreamed it thrice, three times, and each time with new circumstances. Having gone to bed last night, fatigued and out of spirits, I fell asleep shortly after my prayer and slept calmly for about two and a half hours. Then I awoke and continued awake to midnight, all sorts of thoughts passing through my mind. Among other things, I thought how I was supposed to observe the Feast of All Saints. I prayed for the poor souls in purgatory and supplicated God to guide me, my counsels, and my people according to truth." So even though they're in the darkness, they're beginning to come out, and he's wanting truth. I again fell asleep and then dreamed that Almighty God sent me a monk who was a true son of the Apostle Paul. All the saints accompanied him by order of God in order to bear testimony before me and to declare that he did not come to contrive any plot, but all that he did was according to the will of God. They asked me to have the goodness graciously to permit him to write something on the door of the church of the castle of Wittenberg. This I granted through my chancellor. Thereupon the monk went to the church and began to write in such large characters that I could read the writing at Schweinitz, which is 32 miles away. The pen which he used was so large that its end reached as far as Rome, where it pierced the ears of a lion that was crouching there and caused the triple crown upon the head of the Pope to shake. All the cardinals and princes running hastily up tried to prevent it from falling. You and I, brother, wished to assist also, and I stretched out my arm. But at this moment I awoke with my arm in the air, quite amazed and very much enraged at the monk for not managing his pen better. I recollected myself a little. It's only a dream. I was still half asleep and once more closed my eyes. The dream returned. The lion, still annoyed by the pen, began to roar with all his might, so much so that the whole city of Rome and all the states of the Holy Empire ran to see what the matter was. The Pope requested them to oppose this monk and applied particularly to, to me on account of his being in my country. I again awoke, repeated the Lord's play, prayer, entreated God to preserve his holiness, and once more fell asleep. Then I dreamed that all the princes of the empire, and we among them, hastened to Rome and strove one after another to break the pen. But the more we tried, the stiffer it became, sounding as if it had been made of iron. We at length desisted. I then asked the monk where he got this pen and why it was so strong. The pen, he replied, belonged to an old goose of Bohemia a hundred years ago. I got it from one of my old schoolmasters. As to its strength, it is owing to the impossibility of depriving it of its pith or marrow. And I am quite astonished at it myself. Suddenly I heard a loud noise. A large number of other pins had sprung out of the long pin of the monk. I awoke a third time, and it was daylight. And for your information, John Huss was the Bohemian reformer. He was the goose. Huss was burned at the stake 
but he predicted that within a hundred years, a swan would arise that would not be able to burn, and Luther loved to portray himself as that swan. During the time that Martin was hiding away at the uh, castle, uh, some of the church members uh, decided to uh, take things into their own hands and began demolishing altars and statues in Catholic churches. And uh, he had often said that he was afraid sooner or later the devil would send in fanaticism. And so he finally decided to come out of hiding to meet the situation and stop the destruction. And very strong words told the people that uh, their battle was a spiritual one. It was not to be a physical battle, but a spiritual battle, and they were not to harm uh, people or things uh, in their work to, to reach others. He returned uh, to Wittenberg and then completed his extraordinary translation of the Bible into German. Um, and what was so amazing is that at that time, uh, there was no single predominant German dialect. There were many different dialects. But he, through his work, uh, stabilized the German language and unified, really unified the country and the language itself. And today, his work is, is highly admired, even by those who may not believe in his message. Um, and they refer to uh, the way that he wrote the Bible so beautifully um, as early High German or Hochdeutsch uh, in German, but it made a tremendous difference. And what was so amazing, in the little town of Wittenberg, there was a printer who saw an opportunity. And during the next few years, he printed over 300,000 of Luther's Bibles. Shortly after the nun's penance, Katerina and her aunt Lena, the nun, decided they were going to write the great Dr. Luther himself and ask for help to escape. There were ten other girls that wanted to leave, but this was a huge secret. Aunt Lena managed to get the letter out by way of the gardener whose family she had helped when they were sick. They all prayed that the great Dr. Luther would help them, these little insignificant nuns, and they waited. Well, Dr. Luther received the nun's letter, and boy, did he frown when he read it. Poor women. Didn't they know, though, that if he were caught helping them escape, he'd probably have to pay for it with his life? But he had to do something. They depended on him. Then an idea came to him. Leonard Cope, his friend, who did business with the convent, he supplied their fish. He's the man. So Martin wrote him a letter. When Cope re received it, he shook his head, too. This assignment did not at all appeal to him. This could be dangerous business. Yet he couldn't turn a deaf ear to the plea of his friend and spiritual leader and also to the appeal of these young women. While thinking about it, in walked his young nephew, who's also named Leonard, and his friend Wolf. His eyes lighted up. They were the answer. These young men would relish an adventure. And so he asked them, he told them about the request. We'd be glad to help, they replied. We will start planning now. Well, it happened the Saturday night before Easter Sunday. That evening, the nuns always had to go to sleep very early as they had to wake up at midnight to worship the risen Lord. Merchant Cope had delivered a load of herring to the convent earlier in the day and gone off on other business. The kitchen help emptied the barrels and stood them by the gate so that the merchant could pick them up at his convenience. Well, it was now 10 o'clock on Saturday night, and that was the convenient time. Leonard and Wolf loaded the empty barrels onto the wagon and waited. Just then, all 12 of the nuns, who didn't go to sleep early, squeezed through a high, narrow window, slunk next to the wall, and then got out through the iron gate. The young men helped them onto the wagon, which wasn't easy with their long robes. They squeezed in between the two rows of empty barrels and huddled down in a very small, confined space. Some black canvas was then tied over the entire wagon, and off they went. The smell was nauseating, and the cold night air made the women shiver. Once the wagon came to a halt, and the drivers were questioned, "'What do you have in that wagon?' "'Empty herring barrels. We took a load of fish to the convent,' they replied. "'Well, we must check your load to make sure you're not taking contraband goods back to your own province.' With that, the guard began to undo the canvas." 
The nuns froze, hid their faces under their veils. Would they be killed, they thought? Phew, I don't like the smell of that stinky herring, said the guard. Beyond a doubt, you're telling the truth. Tie that canvas back down yourself. Quickly that was accomplished. The whip whistled, the horses strained forward, the wagon lurched. The barrels jostled against the women, bruising them badly, but not a sound escaped their lips. Hours later, out of enemy territory, the wagon stopped. Three of the girls got out and went to the arms of their waiting relatives. The rest reached Torgay, where they stayed a couple of days, and then they were taken to Dr. Luther in Wittenberg. They were free, finally free. Luther preached in the town church and in the crown church. The Germany church announcements were made on the same level as the congregation, but the word of God in the pulpit was to be elevated and raised above the level of the people. Luther was not perfect, but God used him in a mighty way, and he was helpful to many. Martin's barber, certain Peter, once asked Luther how to pray. Overnight, Martin wrote a 40-page pamphlet on how to pray. Take the Lord's Prayer, he said, and contemplate it one phrase at a time until you come to an understanding, an enlightenment, and get an apple out of it. You shake the apple tree more, one phrase, one apple at a time, and pray your way through the scriptures. Husbands were found for all of Katerina's friends. Aunt Lena was older and didn't want to marry, so she went to live and help an older lady. Katerina was the only one left. She was sent then to help Professor Reichenbach and his wife, friends of Luther's. Later, she helped another couple. During those times, she had several suitors, but nothing ever worked out. Dr. Luther tried very hard to find someone suitable for her. He suggested she marry a Caspar Glatz, a very old man. She didn't care for him and apologized, but said she could just not marry him. When friends visited Martin at the Black Cloister, that's what they called his home, they remarked how dirty it was. His clothes were a mess. They said, you need a wife. He reminded them there was a price on his head. He knew he didn't eat well and that his sheets hadn't been washed in a year. But he was always writing and speaking. He didn't have time for that stuff. About then, he visited his parents, and his father suggested he should practice what what he preached. Well, he agreed, not realizing what his father meant. Then his mother said wistfully, Perhaps my old arms can hold your child before I die. Several times they brought up the subject of marriage, and Martin finally surmised, maybe God was trying to tell him something. So he soon went to see Katerina. He asked her to marry him, even though she was 26 and he was 42, and she said, yes. They were married the very next day, Friday, June 13th, 1525. But his salary as a professor and assistant pastor was quite small. No sooner than she had taken over the kitchen duties, hope you can see that one, uh, Martin began taking students in to live. They usually had 20 to 30 at a time. Can you imagine cooking for all that many? And the students were so poor, they had no money to pay for room and board. And Uh, Katerina realized that with no money, the only way they were going to have enough food was to grow it in the garden. So Wolf, who was their gardener, dug up a large area for her to plant carrots, potatoes, cabbages, and turnips. Anytime she had problems, Martin pointed her to the Bible for answers. And with his high profile, they had some problems. But the Bible always provided strength and answers. Without Katerina, Luther would not have been able to accomplish what he did. Katerina immediately had the task of administering and managing the monastery's vast holdings, breeding and selling cattle, visitors seeking audiences with her husband. She ran a brewery of beer and wine to provide for their family, and you're like, oh my goodness. But back then, water was not always safe to drink. Luther called her the boss of Zulsdorf after the name of the farm they owned, and he also called her the morning star of Wittenberg because she always got up at 4 a.m. in the morning to take care of all the responsibilities that she had. Martin gave a marvelous message of the righteous by faith. It was instrumental in pointing out things in the church that needed reform, but he did miss a few things, and one was the Sabbath. 
He could have introduced the Sabbath to the Christian world 500 years ago, but he missed that opportunity. A man named Karlstadt introduced the Sabbath to Luther. Luther insisted on the Bible being the sole authority for all of his teachings, but the Dr. Rick challenged him on that point, since sola scriptura meant by scriptures alone or versus the authority of the Roman Church and the Pope. Eck stunned Luther with this challenge. If, however, the Church has had the power to change the Sabbath of the commandment into Sunday and the command Sunday keeping, why would it not have the power concerning other holy days? If you, however, turn from the Church to the Scriptures alone, you must keep the Sabbath, Saturday, with the Jews, who have kept it from the beginning of the world. Almost no one knows today of Andreas Bodenstein Karlstadt, another reformer, but he must have been greatly impressed by the challenge because from then on he himself strongly advocated the observance of Sabbath uh, on Saturday. His staunch support to the Sabbath caused Luther to write, if Karlstadt were to write further about the Sabbath, Sunday would have to give away. And the Sabbath, that is Saturday, must be kept holy. But uh, Luther did not because it all was very possible that it was not God's timing. Um, but there were some other much greater issues that had to be uh, taken up first. Katerina worked very hard that soon Martin had to get her Aunt Lena back to their home for, to help her. She bore him six children, Johann, or Hans for short, Elizabeth, who died at eight months, Magdalena, who died at 13, Martin, Paul, and Marguerite, and in addition, she suffered a miscarriage. The Luther family also raised four orphan children, including Katerina's nephew, Fabian. Evening time was family time for the Luthers and Aunt Lena. There was lots of happiness, singing, and prayers. One evening, Cathay left her doctor, as she called him often, to look after Hans for a few minutes. Martin held him for a little while and thought he could lay him down so he could continue writing. But as babies often do, he didn't want to be let go. He wanted to be held and receive attention. So Luther composed a lullaby to help him go to sleep. Luther also wrote many hymns and made sure that the church services included music. Cathay had learned Latin and knew the names of many ailments. She also knew the treatments used to cure them. And when Martin traveled, he was always treated to rich food, which he greatly enjoyed, but it, it caused him great pain and problems with his gallbladder. Once home, Katerina used simple foods such as cabbage, carrots, potatoes, and nourishing black bread, and she also poured gallons of herb tea down him to relieve his pain, and it always worked. The Black Plague came through several times, and many evacuated the city, but she always stayed to help and to nurse the sick and dying. If Katerina von Bora had been content to count her beads, do penance for her sin, and close her mind to the truths of the Bible, she would have lived and died in the obscurity of the convent. But because she followed where God led, she became the First Lady of the Protestant Reformation, the wife of the great Dr. Martin Luther and the mother of a fine family. She lived to bless others. She found true happiness in serving those in need. The poor little escaped nun died a truly rich woman, not in this world's goods, but in God's love. The Protestant world today is in the process of undoing everything that happened in the Protestant Reformation. Most of you have probably seen the man Tony Palmer in a video. He's now deceased, but he was a liaison between the Pope and the charismatic evangelical churches. And his comment was, the protest is over. Rick Warren, a well-known evangelist pastor from Saddleback, California stated after meeting with the Pope, we are on the same team. The Catholic Church and the Pope would like for it to be over, and for some it is. They've gone home to Papa. Signs of the Times article, February 18, 1894, stated, it is a backsliding church that lessens the distance between itself and the papacy. We learn from history that we generally do not learn from history. But we also know that history will repeat itself. 500 years ago, it came down to either denying the word of God or being burned. 
history will repeat itself. The chess pieces are now in place. The Great Controversy states, the Word of God teaches that these scenes are to be repeated as Roman Catholics and Protestants unite for the exaltation of Sunday. As our closing hymn today, we will sing A Mighty Fortress is Our God. The title actually is Eine feste Burg ist unser Gott, but you're allowed to sing it in English. <laughs> Please stand. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in your strength, through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, may we emulate and follow the example of the faith of our spiritual fathers. In Jesus' name we ask, amen.